At the 2016 Los Angeles Auto Show, running from November 18th to the 27th, Jaguar Land Rover unveiled their very first all-electric production car, the Jaguar I-Pace. Designed by Ian Callum, the concept unveiled looked to revolutionize the British EV scene and fueled a challenge towards Tesla, who had been dominating the electric ring at the time. The SUV promised a range of over 200 miles and featured an all-wheel drive system supported by two electric motors and powered by a 90 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery. The I-Pace could accelerate from 0 to 60 in about 4.8 seconds and boasted a top speed of 124 miles per hour. After its official launch in 2018, the car won many awards internationally. It was named the European Car of the Year for 2019 and later became the World Car of the Year for 2019. For Jaguar, it was a huge success and one they looked to build upon as they progressed into the EV market. Three months prior to its unveiling, however, Jaguar Land Rover made another major announcement. On August 19, 2016, the British manufacturer announced they would enter the FIA Formula E Championship for its third season, their first racing project as a works team since their departure from Formula One in 2004. At the time, it seemed like an ambitious venture, hot on the heels of other major manufacturers. However, in just a few years' time, the two parties would collaborate on a series that would divide the fan base a series that would be influential to Jaguar's success as a manufacturer, and a series that would be prematurely cancelled and left to be forgotten. This is the complete story of Formula E's short-lived support series, the Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy. Talks about an all-electric Jaguar racing series began even before Jaguar Land Rover's official entry to the series. After a largely unsuccessful inaugural season, which saw drivers Adam Carroll and Mitch Evans place last in the constructor standings, some were questioning Jaguar's commitment to the series. However, these talks would soon be put to rest. Just a few months after Season 3 concluded, on September 12, 2017 at the Frankfurt Auto Show, the Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy was officially announced. Chairman of Jaguar Racing Gerd Mauser and the CEO of Formula E Holdings Alejandro Agog presented the official Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy race car and the initial plans for the series. Starting with a three-year deal, the series would serve as an official feeder series to the Formula E Championship, with their 10-race calendar closely following their parent series and the races serving as companion events on select Formula E weekends. The series would follow what Jaguar dubbed an Arrive and Drive package, which allowed up to 20 drivers to compete in any single race, and were planning to introduce VIP drivers to complement each venue. Michelin would serve as a tire provider, and all Jaguar race cars would be built to spec completely identical. The cars themselves would of course be modified versions of the Jaguar I-Pace. Built by Jaguar's Special Vehicle Operations Department, the car featured an aluminum chassis and was reinforced with an FIA-approved roll cage. The car would be longer, wider, and lower than its road legal counterpart. Aerodynamic changes included the installation of a large rear wing and front splitter, as well as a redesigned front bumper to better channel air towards the internal systems. In terms of power, the car ran on the same four-wheel drive Jaguar dual motor and the 90 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery as the road car. The motor is now dead running 436 horsepower and over 500 pound-foot of torque. The car could go from 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds, 0.3 seconds faster than the road car, and topped out with a max speed of 121 miles per hour. In addition, the car required an upgraded air conditioning unit to cool both the batteries and the electric motors. All summed up, 20 I-Paces were built, each costing around $260,000. As stated previously, each car would be spec, with teams only allowed to make minor modifications to the car's suspension, tire pressures, and rear wing angles during the race weekend. The first entries for the series began registering in December of 2017 before the car had even been tested. The first tests were completed in early 2018, with group tests picking up in the coming months. The first season was scheduled to start alongside the 2018-19 Formula E season in December of 2018 in Diria, Saudi Arabia. From there, it would take a two-month hiatus until the Mexico City e Prix in February of 2019. Then they would follow the Formula E schedule for the next six events, in Hong Kong, Sanya, Rome, Paris, Monaco, and Berlin, before ending the season off in New York City. The series would feature two classes of drivers, Pro and Pro-Am. Each would score points on separate tables, but would run the same car. The first team to announce their program would be American IndyCar and IMSA team Rahal Letterman Lanigan Racing. The team would field two drivers in the pro category, with British driver Catherine Legg and American driver Brian Sellers, both at the time racing in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Next to announce their program would be Jaguar Brazil Racing. The team primarily competed in the Brazilian Stock Car Pro Series, winning the championship in 2015 and 2016. They also fielded two pro entries, driven by five-time Brazilian Stock Car Pro champion Kaká Bueno and Brazilian endurance racer Sergio Jimenez. Brother of Jaguar Formula E driver Mitch Evans, Simon Evans, would join the pro category as well, racing full-time with Team Asia New Zealand. The Formula E team Tachita would join the series as TWR Tachita, originally scheduling Canadian Stefan Radzinski for seven races, but eventually replacing him with ex-Jaguar FE driver Adam Carroll. 
In November, the first Pro-Am entry was announced in the Ellendorf-based Wiesmann Team Germany. They would choose French Jaguar Nürburgring test driver Celia Martin for the seat. The simply titled Saudi Racing would field two full-time Pro-Am entries, both for Saudi Arabian drivers in Bandar El Asai and Ahmed Bid Khanan, who were endurance racers in the Middle Eastern Championships. Finally, another simply titled team in China racing would again field two Pro-Am cars. Chinese Open Wheel and GT driver Yeki Zhang would race full-time in the 9 entry, while their other entry would be split between Chinese drivers Zi Yi Zhang, Ta Wang, and Qi Lin over the course of the season. An Austrian team and Team Bliner looked to enter the series before the second round, but eventually withdrew. Joining the independent teams would be the official Jaguar VIP car, fielding a different VIP driver for almost every single race. The VIP car would not score points in either the Pro or Pro-Am standings. Speaking of the points, the points format would work similarly to Formula E as the top 10 scored points, though in slightly reduced amounts. It's worth noting that with less than 10 cars in each class, each driver who finished the race would get points, as each class was awarded points separately. One point would also be given to the pole winner of each class. After a few months of testing, the series was ready to kick off their inaugural season in December of 2018 alongside Formula E at the Riyadh Street Circuit. It would make history for being the first ever racing event in Saudi Arabia that featured both male and female drivers. The race weekend would consist of two days. On Friday, a shakedown and practice session would precede a 30-minute qualifying session and 25-minute plus one lap race. For the first race in Diria, qualifying would be cancelled due to heavy rains. The starting order fell on the times from FP2, giving Simon Evans the pole position, while the first Pro-Am driver was Bandar El Asai in P6, and as the lights went out, Evans would retain the lead into Turn 1. From there, he would cruise to victory, leading every lap, but never really breaking away from the rest of the field. Jimenez and Sellers finished at the pro podium after a decent battle, while VIP driver Alice Powell made up two places to finish fifth overall, followed by fellow female driver Catherine Legg, who made up three places to finish fifth in her class. Bandar El Asai easily took the Pro-Am win by almost 15 seconds over his teammate Ahmed Bin Kanan, with Tao Wang rounding out the first Pro-Am podium. Race 2 took place in Mexico at the Autodromo Hermano Rodriguez almost two months later. Rihal Letterman Lanigan Racing would show real speed in qualifying, claiming a 1-2 with Catherine Legg on pro pole ahead of Brian Sellers. Bandar El Asai would claim pole for the Pro-Am class once again over China Racing's Yaki Zhang. The first lap would be very entertaining, as while Legg got away clean, VIP and ex-Formula E driver Salvador Duran blasted past Evans in a P3, and Zhang claimed the Pro-Am lead away from Bandar El Asai. A brief full-course yellow was called for debris, however once they got back racing, Duran, in an attempt to hold the Brazilian off, turned Kaka Bueno, forcing Simon Evans off. While trying to rejoin, Duran then blocked Pro-Am driver Bandar El Asai, so somehow in the span of one corner, Salvador Duran managed to hold up both championship leaders in both of the points classes. A few more incidents plagued the field, but nothing too major. The rest of the race was pretty entertaining and saw Alisai and Evans fight back through the field, with Alisai actually able to take the Pro-Am lead after a narrow fight with teammate Bin Kanan. At the front, Rahal will claim a 1-2 with Catherine Legg claiming her first victory over teammate Brian Sellers. This would vault Legg to the points lead by one point over Evans, Jimenez, and Sellers. In the Pro-Am class, Alisai's second straight victory, as well as Bin Kanan's second straight runner-up finish, led the Saudi racing drivers to take comfortable control over the points lead. Race 3 would see the series travel to Hong Kong. Bueno would take the pole in the Pro class in a damp qualifying session while Yaki Zhang would earn his first pole in the Pro-Am class over this race's Jaguar VIP driver, Hong Kong native Daryl O. Young. The race would also start under damp conditions, with the SUVs piling into the infamous Hong Kong hairpin. Catherine Legg was able to jump from 6th to 3rd while Sergio Jimenez made up 4 spots from P12. Celia Martin, meanwhile, was able to take the lead of the Pro-Am class. After a brief full-course yellow due to debris, Yaki Zhang was able to take the lead from Martin through a bump and run into the hairpin. As the track dried, Brian Sellers was able to chase down and eventually pass Kaka Bueno for the pro lead as the latter locked up into the hairpin. This was the first ever lead change in the pro class. Bueno fell further back as the battle began for the last spot on the pro podium. In a frantic fight that went all the way down to the wire, Sergio Jimenez got into Simon Evans into the final corner, sending the Kiwi into the wall coming to the line. Sellers led another Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan 1 2 over Leg, with Jimenez charging up to P3, an amazing drive considering the Brazilians started last, finishing just ahead of Evans, who managed to scrape by with a P4. Yaki Zhang was able to pull away from the Pro Am field to earn his first victory over Alisai. This would allow Sellers to take the Pro Am lead of the title over Catherine Leg. Evans fell all the way down to P4 as Jimenez moved to P3. In the Pro-Am standings, Alisai still held a comfortable lead over teammate Bin Kanan, Zhang now threatening the latter for P2. Race 4 came to the Heitang Bay Circuit in Sanya, China. 
Kaka Bueno would claim his second pole in a row over Simon Evans, while Bandar al Asai claimed his third pole of the Pro-Am season in P6 overall. The first half of the race was pretty mundane, with most of the order retaining their positions. With about 16 minutes left in the race, the 8 of Tao Wang came to a stop on the track, and a red flag was called to recover the car. The red flag lasted about 10 minutes, but the time on the clock was not stopped as is usual practice with Formula E. So essentially, 10 minutes of the race were lost and not made back. The safety car went in with just under 5 minutes left in the race, there was a bit of passing, but for the most part, they finished the race the same way they started it. Kaka Bueno took Brazil Racing's first win over Simon Evans and Brian Sellers. Sellers was disqualified, however, post-race due to using non-factory installed dampers and having a zip tie on the rear shock absorber, giving P3 to Stefan Zedzinski. Bandar al Asai won his third Pro-Am race over teammate Ben Conan. In the points, Sellers' disqualification dropped him to P3, giving the title lead to Simon Evans once again. Not much changed on the Pro-Am side. Race 5 took place in Rome. Brazil Racing scored their third straight pole with Sergio Jimenez, while Ahmed Bin Khanin scored his first Pro-Am pole with a P6 overall. Jimenez would lead off the line as we saw a fair bit of side-by-side -side action to open the race. Midway through the race, rain began to pick up on the already damp track. With about 8 minutes left, Ahmed Bin Khanin, who was leading the Pro-Am class, lost it into the hairpin, slamming the wall and losing the lead. Sergio Jimenez won his first career race over Brian Sellers and Simon Evans, with Al Asai taking win number 4 in the Pro-Am class. This sent Jimenez to the lead of the Pro standings by 5 points over Sellers and 6 over Evans. Yaki Zhang claimed P2 in the Pro-Am standings from Bin Condon after his wreck, while Al Asai still held a 42-point lead. Race 6 came to Paris at the Circuit Dan Valadez. Brian Sellers claimed the pole over Kaka Bueno while Bandar Al Asai claimed the Pro-Am pole once again. Sellers got away off the line as they were able to get a 4-wide then down without much of an incident. It didn't take long though, as VIP driver Archie Hamilton slammed into Celia Martin, causing Hamilton to retire early. A safety car was called as heavy rain began to pick up on the track, eventually though this transitioned to hail, soon after which Kaka Bueno lost it into turn 13, taking out Catherine Legg. The race was then red flagged, and due to damage to the barriers, it was called with about 5 minutes left. Brian Sellers took the win over Zadzinski and Jimenez, while Ahmed Bin Khanin scored his first Pro-Am win. This moved Sellers back atop the Pro Points table over Jimenez, while Bin Khanin moved back to P2 in the Pro-Am standings. Race 7 took place at the famous circuit de Monaco, though using the original Formula E configuration and not the Grand Prix layout. Brazil Racing topped the standings in qualifying, with Bueno coming out on top while Alessai scored pole for the Pro-Am as usual. The Brazil Racing drivers pulled away off the start while Sellers made contact with Zedzinski for P3, but Zedzinski eventually turning Sellers' teammate leg into the wall causing a brief red flag. After the race went back green, the two Brazil Racing cars attempted to battle for the lead, but Jimenez was ultimately unable to pass Bueno. Alessai lost the Pro-Am lead early on, and for most of the race, the Pro-Am battle was between Yaki Zhang and Ahmed Bin Khanin, with Bin Khanin eventually running wide and retiring from the race. Jagger Brazil Racing finished 1-2 with Bueno on top once again, claiming his second victory. Yaki Zhang claimed his second victory of the season in the Pro-Am class over Alessai, moving him to P2 in the standings. The Pro standings remain relatively unchanged, with the exception of Bueno moving into P4, and the points gap between Sellers and Jimenez being reduced to 1 point, with 3 races left. Race 8 took the series to Berlin. Bueno and Jimenez saw themselves atop qualifying once again, with Al Asai on the Pro-Am pole once again. The wider track in Berlin would allow for a much better chance of passing, or spinning, with Catherine Legg turning Pro-Am points leader Al Asai around early. After TWA Tachita replaced Stefan Zedzinski with Adam Carroll, the ex-Jaguar Formula E driver was pretty competitive, fighting for a podium and managing this sick drift. Celia Martin and Yaki Zhang fought for the Pro-Am lead, with Zhang taking the lead and Martin battling with the other Zhang, eventually resulting in Z Zhang spinning around, spinning Ahmed Bin Khanin around in the process. Bueno took his second consecutive victory and led Brazil Racing's second consecutive 1-2, with Yaki Zhang scoring his second consecutive Pro-Am win. This led Jimenez to take back the points lead by 6 points over Sellers, heading into the final doubleheader weekend in New York, while El Sai's spin meant that the Pro-Am championship fight was technically not over yet. Race 9 was the first of the New York City doubleheaders to end the 2018-19 season. Points leader Jimenez took the pole position as disaster would strike his championship rival Brian Sellers, with the American crashing during his qualifying lap, causing enough damage to force him to withdraw from the race completely, almost certainly giving up the championship to Jimenez. The Brazil racing drivers maintained control of the race, holding off Simon Evans in P3. With less than 12 minutes left, Zi Zhang sent VIP driver Mark hacking into the barriers. Although a red flag was not called, it took all of the time left in the race to clear the car off the track. The safety car went in for a one-lap shootout in which nothing much happened. Sergio Jimenez took his second victory of the season and with it, claimed the first ever Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy Pro Class title. Meanwhile, Bandar Al-Asai took his fifth Pro-Am victory, clinching the first ever Pro-Am title. 
So with the championships already wrapped up, race 10 was essentially a formality. Now Champion Jimenez took the pole over teammate Bueno again, while Ahmed Bin Kane took the Pro-Am pole. It was entertaining to watch Brian Sellers, who started from the rear, make his way up the field, and Catherine Legg, who put pressure on Kaka Bueno for P2, but ultimately the race was fairly uneventful overall. Jimenez took the victory, his third of the season, over teammate Bueno and Legg. Ahmed Bin Kane took his second Pro-Am victory over Yaki Zhang and Bandar al -Asai. And with that, the first season of the Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy was officially completed. Jimenez won the pro title by 28 points over teammate Bueno, with Sellers coming in third. Evans in fourth, Leg in fifth, and Zedzinski and Carroll rounding out the pro field. It's worth noting that the TWR Tachita team, the only car that failed to win a pro race, withdrew from the last two events in New York. It's also interesting to see how strong Brazil Racing became in the second half of the year, and the slight fall off from Rahal Letterman Lanigan. On the pro side, it was al -Asai all year long with five victories and only two races off the podium. Yaki Zhang and Ahmed Minkana kept up with him for the most part, claiming multiple victories each. The only other full-time entry Celia Martin had an up and down year, while Zhi Zhang was the best of China racing split car. So after the first season, there is quite a bit to talk about. While it's unfortunate that Seller's qualifying crash eliminated what would have been an otherwise pretty entertaining championship fight, the points battle at least in the pro class was pretty close all year long. Another thing to note was that the VIP drivers had little effect on the actual race and were generally uncompetitive. Alice Powell got the best result out of any VIP driver at race 1 in Diria with a P5. For the most part, the names elected to race were, let's face it, not all too exciting. Heck, Mark Hacking and Jens Drail were journalists with some racing experience. Literal journalists. As for the racing overall, it was fairly decent in races like Mexico, Hong Kong, and Berlin, as well as the bit of the Paris race we got to see, but many of the other races were essentially processions with very little passing. It's not like the cars were pulling away from each other, as the margin of victory for 7 of the 10 pro races was under a second, but in many cases the car in second just couldn't get past the leader. In only one pro race and four pro-am races, the pole winner failed to win the race. So the goals for season 2 were try to increase passing, potentially bring in more cars and bigger names, and overall try to strengthen the on-track product in terms of competition and cleanliness. Season 2 of the Jaguar I-Pace e Trophy was scheduled to begin alongside Formula E's Season 6. The series would open with a doubleheader in Diria, then travel to Mexico for Race 3. Hong Kong would be removed, jumping straight to Sanya, Rome, then Paris. Monaco would be removed as well, jumping straight to Berlin, then New York for one race, and ending up the season at the new London Excel circuit for a doubleheader. The points format would be kept the same, as with the race format barring one addition. For Season 2, Attack Mode was introduced. If you're not familiar with this concept in Formula E, attack mode is a temporary power boost a driver can use by driving offline at a specific corner or portion of the track. In the E-Trophy, it boosted the car's power by 20%, up to 325 kilowatts. The duration of it, as well as how many needed to be used per race, varied, but the intent was the same as with Formula E, to increase passing and add an element of strategy. The team and driver lineup did change a fair bit between seasons. In the pro class, TWR Tatita and unfortunately Rahal Letterman Lanigan as well both pulled out of the series. Jaguar Brazil Racing returned, now titled Zeg Icaros Jaguar Brazil Racing, with two pro entries. Sergio Jimenez returned to defend his championship alongside Kaka Bueno, who would miss the opening two rounds of Diria due to Brazil's stock car commitments and would be replaced by Mario Haberfield. Team Asia New Zealand also returned with their driver Simon Evans. The previously Pro-Am team and Wiesmann Team Germany moved to the Pro class, now titled Jaguar Ran Racing E-Trophy Team Germany. Celia Martin would be let go in favor of previously VIP driver Alice Powell. The first two rounds of Dario would feature only four Pro entries, but that would change starting with round three. On the Pro-Am side, champion Saudi Racing, with the goal of giving as many Saudi drivers a chance in a global series as they could, would feature an all-new driver lineup. Bandar al Asai would not return, instead replaced by fellow Saudi driver Fahad al Ghosaibi. He would be partnered with Meshur Balhajaila for the first three races of the series. China Racing also returned with defending runner-up Yaki Zhang, alongside touring car driver Sun Chao. Again, for the first two races in Duria, only four drivers in the Pro-Am class would be present. Finally, the Jaguar VIP car would return with an even more ambitious plan. They would open up two VIP cars this season, looking to give drivers as much seat time as possible. For the first of the doubleheader races to open the season in Saudi Arabia, Simon Evans took pole position over Sergio Jimenez in the Pro class. The first of the VIP drivers, Abby Eaton, took P3. Yaki Zhang scored the Pro-Am pole while the second VIP car in Rima Jafali, the first Saudi woman to compete in a racing event, qualified P10. Evans retained the lead off the start while Alice Powell and Sergio Jimenez followed. Evans won the race lights to flag for the second year in a row, while Jimenez and Powell fought hard to round off the podium. Yaki Zhang finished an impressive P4 to win the Pro-Am category ahead of VIP driver Abby Eaton. 
The next day, for race 2 of the doubleheader, Sergio Jimenez would claim pole over Simon Evans, while Yaki Zhang would win the pole for the Pro-Am category once again. Jimenez would clear Evans off the start, while Alice Powell would fight with the Pro-Am leader Zhang for most of the race. Midway through the race, Fahad al Saibi got together with Mario Haberfield, turning the Saudi racing driver into the wall, bringing out a red flag. After the track was cleared, the race resumed, though without any real incident. Sergio Jimenez took the win over Evans, while Yaki Zhang led a China Racing 1-2 in the Pro-Am class. So, leaving Saudi Arabia, Sergio Jimenez and Simon Evans would be tied for the Pro Points lead, with Yaki Zhang in command of the Pro-Am standings. February 15th marked the third race of the season in Mexico City, and there were many headlines going into the weekend. One major story was that Jaguar China Racing, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions in China, could not run their two Pro-Am entries in Sun Chao and Pro-Am points leader Yaki Zhang. The team decided to replace Chao with fellow Chinese driver David Chang, and replace Zhang with Mexico native Manuel Carranza. Because of this, the second China Racing entry would run in the Pro class. Another storyline was the return of defending series runner-up Kaka Bueno after missing the first two races. A new team would enter the series in Team Yokohama Challenge, fielding a pro entry for Japanese driver Takuma Aoki. Aoki was a disabled driver, being paralyzed in an accident in 1998, and would drive a modified I-Pace with hand controls. Overall, a remarkable feat. Defending champions Zeg Icaro's Brazil Racing expanded their team to the Pro-Am class, fielding a full-time entry for Adalberto Baptista. And finally, the Jaguar VIP car would run Mario Dominguez and Vincent Radermecker. For some strange reason though, Radermecker only ran in practice and his times were never recorded. Qualifying for the race was cancelled due to Daniel Lapp's crash in Formula E practice. This gave Sergio Jimenez and Fahad Agosaibi the respective poles in their categories based off of practice times. Jimenez kept the lead off the start, while VIP driver Dominguez leapt from 7th on the grid to 4th. Early contact would bring out the safety car as Mashir Bahajaila would get together with David Chang, forcing both cars to retire. Throughout the race, we'd see occasional battles such as the one between Takuma Aoki, Kaka Bueno, and Adalberto Baptista for fifth. Late in the race, we'd see the first pass for the lead of the season, as Simon Evans, using attack mode, would pass Jimenez around the outside of turn 9. The next lap with Jimenez in attack mode, he retaliated, earning the lead back at the same spot. Jimenez would win the race over Evans, with VIP driver Mario Dominguez coming home an impressive third. Takuma Aoki, however, would become the first paralyzed driver to score a podium, placing third in the pro class and fourth overall. Fahad Akosabi, meanwhile, took the win in the Pro-Am class. Jimenez would extend his points lead over Evans to 5 points in the Pro standings, while Akosabi moved into P2 in the standings, still behind Zhang, despite the Chinese driver not having competed in this race. And well, we all know what happened next. The COVID-19 pandemic forced lockdowns across the world. Every major motorsport shut down, and drivers entered isolation. On March 13th, Formula E and the FIA temporarily suspended operations. With the state of the main Formula E championship in jeopardy, one could only imagine what was going through the minds of the organizers of the Jaguar I-Pace E trophy. Unfortunately, things didn't look good. On May 18th, 2020, it was announced that the Jaguar I-Pace E trophy would end following the conclusion of its second season. Primarily blaming the economic impact of the pandemic, Jaguar claimed that though it was a loss, they were satisfied with the success of the championship and believed it had achieved many of the goals they were looking to accomplish with it. It was unclear whether the last seven races of the E Trophy season would take place at all, along with the nine races left on the Formula E calendar. Fortunately, arrangements were able to be made. On June 17th, it was announced that the series would close out its season at the Berlin Tempelhof circuit alongside Formula E. Seven E Trophy races would have to be completed within a nine day period and would have to work their way around the already packed Formula E scheduling. The series would schedule a return in early August, with the first two races taking place on August 5th and August 6th, both using the reverse configuration of the Tempelhof circuit. Then on August 8th and August 9th, three races would be run using the traditional Berlin layout with a double header on the 9th. Finally, the last two races on August 12th and 13th would use a heavily altered version of the original layout named Tempelhof Park. The series return would see many changes in the team and driver lineups. China Racing would pull out of the Pro-Am class altogether, instead fielding two full-time Pro entries driven by Australian Nick Foster and the youngest driver in the field, Frenchman Gregory Seguiers. Saudi Racing driver Meshur Belhajala would be unable to attend the event in Berlin and would be originally replaced by Season 1 driver Admin Bin but after Bin Khanin would also be unable to race, the seat was filled by Saudi Racing's team manager Paul Spooner, who although British, chose to race under a Saudi license to preserve the image of the team. Finally, the seven races in Berlin would see a whole host of different VIP drivers. For the first two races, British driver Oliver Webb would race, before being replaced by compatriot Abby Eaton for the next two. The final two races would see two VIP drivers compete in Austrian driver Sven Forster and British driver Jessica Hawkins. With this, the official roster for the Pro category contained seven cars, while the Pro-Am category contained only a pitiful three. With the grid set and races scheduled, the series was prepared to finish out its season. Brazil Racing would post a 1-2 in qualifying with Bueno on top, while Agosaibi scored the Pro-Am pole. 
Bueno took the lead off the start while Jimenez and rookie Nick Foster battled hard for P2, with Foster eventually getting past the Brazilian. Simon Evans then took to attacking Jimenez for the rest of the race, and they had a great battle over the attack mode periods. Foster looked to challenge Bueno early, but after damage from a trailing diffuser, he dropped out of the fight. Bueno would take the victory with Foster coming in an impressive P2 in his first ever E-Trophy start, and Evans rounding out the podium. Aldo Saibi cruised to an easy victory in the Pro-Am class. In terms of points, not much would change in the Pro category while Agusabi took the lead of the Pro-Am category as the active drivers made their way past drivers no longer competing. The next day, Bueno took his second pole in a row once again over teammate Jimenez, Agusabi winning the Pro-Am pole once again. Jimenez and Foster would again battle for second before Jimenez cleared allowing Evans to battle Foster. The top four in the Pro class would fight each other for most of the race, with attack mode playing a crucial factor. Bueno, who had led the race up till then, failed to activate attack mode by missing the markers. This gave up the lead to Jimenez and ultimately second to Evans. Evans and Jimenez then fought hard for the victory in the closing stages, with Jimenez using attack mode to ultimately claim the victory. VIP driver Oliver Webb finished an impressive fourth, while Agusaibi claimed his third consecutive Pro-Am win. 1-2 meant that Evans was able to keep Jimenez in check in terms of the standings, but the Brazilian was able to extend his lead to 7 points. The next race would see the direction of the circuit flip to its usual configuration. Jimenez would start on pole and retain the lead for most of the race. The leaders would all stay relatively close, emphasizing the role of attack mode. With less than 6 minutes to go, Nick Foster took the lead after Jimenez and Evans took their attack modes. Foster fought hard to keep a charging Jimenez behind him, and the two had a really close battle throughout the closing stages of the race. On the penultimate lap of the race, Foster opted to use his attack mode, but crucially missed the activation zones, allowing the two Brazil racing cars to easily go past. Foster fought hard to keep up though, and on a lunge against Kaká Bueno, the two made contact, damaging Foster's car while giving up P2 and P3 to Bueno and Evans respectively. Foster would take his attack mode on the last lap and try to charge back up the order, but ultimately got together with Alice Powell, knocking him out of the race. Jimenez took an easy victory over Bueno and Evans, with Alcusabi taking another Pro-Am win. Honestly, this was one of the most exciting E-Trophy races there were. Lots of drama and a really close fight for the lead for most of the race. I really do feel for Foster though. In the points, Jimenez was able to extend his lead to 17 points, while in the Pro-Am category, Agasaiba's lead was now 46 points over Adalberto Baptista. Jimenez and Foster would start the next race in the front row and control the race for most of the first half. There were a few battles in the rear as the drivers in the Pro class fought the leaders of the Pro-Am, but nothing too crazy. Midway through the race, Simon Evans would make a charge from P4, making his way past Bueno and passing Foster as he took his attack mode. He then chased down Jimenez, making up almost 1.5 seconds in just a few laps. With just under 3 minutes left, Jimenez took attack mode, dropping to P3 and giving the lead to Evans. It wouldn't take long for the Brazilian to catch up though, being right on Evans' tail as the clock ticked down. Heading on to the final lap, Jimenez took his second attack mode, charging past Bueno and reaching Evans relatively quickly. Jimenez got a run on Evans coming out of the penultimate corner, that was forced to the outside for the final hairpin. Choosing to duck underneath Evans, the two would be side by side in the front stretch, with Evans just barely coming out by just over a tenth. Another great fight for the win. With three races to go, Evans trimmed Jimenez's point lead down to 14 points, while another dominating win for Agusabi allowed him to clinch the title in the next race. This race, however, would see a twist. The starting order would be determined by reversing the finishing order of the previous race. This put Pro-Am driver Paul Spooner on the front row, while Jimenez and Evans started from the rear. Spooner retained the lead early on, with Takuma Aoki jumping to second. Jimenez and Evans used their attack modes early, carving their way through the field. We'd see a lot of passing early in the race, as the Pro contenders made their way up, and the slower cars battling out at the front. We'd see a nice battle for the overall lead between Paul Spooner and a charging Gregory Seguiris. By the 8 minute mark, Evans and Jimenez were already in the top 5. A short while later, Jimenez took the lead from Spooner, with Seguiris and Evans following through. Evans was able to get into second and spent much of the race chasing down Jimenez. Meanwhile, Fahad Agosabi was able to take advantage of Paul Spooner's late attack mode to take the Pro-Am lead away. Evans had saved two attack modes to use at the end of the race, and took them one after the other as the clock ticked down. On the final lap, Evans made his move. Coming out of turn 4, he pulled to the outside and cleared Jimenez down the straight. Jimenez was forced to take his second attack mode on the final lap, but ultimately the gap it created was too large for him to overcome. Evans took the victory over Jimenez, with Kanka Bueno edging out Gregory Seguiris for third, while Agosabi took his sixth Pro-Am victory of the season, thus clinching the Pro-Am title two races early, Saudi Racing second consecutive championship. In terms of the Pro standings, Evans had now trimmed the gap down to just eight points. Those two were the only drivers left now in championship contention. The penultimate race of the season saw the layout switch once again to the altered Templehof Park layout. Kaká Bueno would score the pole over Simon Evans with title rival Sergio Jimenez lining up P3. The opening portion of the race was rather tame, with the leaders breaking away slightly in their starting order, while further back, Adalberto Baptista battled Alcosabi and Takuma Aoki, eventually losing the Pro-Am lead. 
With about 12 minutes left in the race, race leader Bueno looked to activate his first attack mode, but ran wide, missing the markers and losing the lead to Evans in the process. The next few laps, Bueno activated both his attack modes and was able to pass Evans as he used his second attack mode. This, however, gave Evans the advantage, allowing him to rocket around the outside of Bueno down the front stretch. Further back, Paul Spooner was able to pass teammate Alcasabi into turn 1, taking the Pro-Am lead. With Evans far ahead, Brazil Racing opted to use team orders, slowing Bueno down in P2 and allowing Jimenez to take the second spot. This was the order they finished in, with Evans claiming the victory while Paul Spooner took his first Pro-Am win. The Pro Series standings heading into the final race of the season were tight. Jimenez now led Evans by only 3 points. Essentially, if both drivers finished in the top 4, then the higher finishing driver would take the championship. Would it be defending champion Sergio Jimenez who would defend his crown for Jaguar Brazil, or New Zealander Simon Evans, who hadn't failed to score a podium all season long? One race now would decide the victor. The final Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy event would once again use the Tempelhof Park layout. Kaka Bueno scored the pole, earning the bonus point, meaning that Evans and Jimenez were still only separated by 3 points. Evans would start second, Jimenez third. As the lights went out, Evans quickly dropped low to cover Jimenez into turn 1. The pair would end up squeezing the China Racing entry of Nick Foster out wide as the leaders pulled away. Jimenez would be the first of the leaders to use attack mode, though much of his time was spent repassing Alice Powell for P3. The next lap, Evans used his first attack mode, just barely rejoining ahead of Jimenez. Kaka Bueno was able to take his attack mode with relative ease, building a larger gap over Evans than second. Farther back, Adalberto Baptista fought with champion Fahad Algosabi for the Pro-Am lead, the two battling hard over the course of the race despite heavy damage on Algosabi's car. With under 7 minutes to go, Evans was back on Bueno's tail and took the lead as the Brazilian took his second attack mode. Bueno, however, used the extra power to earn it back fairly quickly. With under 5 minutes to go, Algosabi would pit, essentially gifting Baptista the Pro-Am win. Back up front, Evans would activate his second attack mode and 8 into Bueno's lead as the clock ticked down. On the final lap, Evans was right on Bueno's bumper but was unable to make the move. As the checkered flag waved on the Jaguar IPC trophy, Kaka Bueno took the victory, with Simon Evans placing P2 and clinching the Pro Championship by just one single point over Sergio Jimenez. An amazing fight to end out the series and certainly ending it out on a high. And so, with Evans P1 and Jimenez P2, each with 4 victories, Kaka Bueno, despite missing the opening 2 rounds in Diria, earned a resounding P3 with 2 victories over Alice Powell. Nick Foster was able to earn an impressive 5th in the standings despite missing 3 races, ahead of Takuma Aoki, Gregory Seguiras, Ario Haberfield, and Manuel Cabrera. In terms of Pro-Am standings, Algosabi went essentially unchallenged, winning 6 races and winning the title by over 60 points. Adalberto Baptista, despite missing the first two events, finished second ahead of Paul Spooner, both earning one victory each. In fourth was Yaki Zhang ahead of Sun Chao, Mashir Balhajaila, and David Chang. Well, a lot to digest from the second season. First of all, what a championship fight for the pro class. Jimenez and Evans were neck and neck practically all season long, and I think if Bueno hadn't missed the first two rounds, he'd have been right there with him, and it would have been an even more spectacular fight. Still though, one point separating the two in the end was insane. The championship battle on Pro-Am was a bit depressing. I'd blame this partially on COVID though. Yaki Zhang was absolutely on form during the first two events in Diria, and I really think he could have put the fight to Fahad al -Gosaibi. Really a shame he had to withdraw. Speaking of Agosabi, he followed up Alasai's dominant performance with an even more dominant one. No one was even remotely close all season until after he had clinched the title. Excellent job by him. In terms of racing, well I gotta say this season was definitely better than the first. Despite only going to three locations, the newly introduced attack mode allowed for a lot of strategy, something that had really been absent in season one. Races such as Mexico, Berlin 3, 4, and 5 were excellent and really entertaining actually. In terms of parity, there wasn't really much this season as we only saw 3 winners in Pro and before the final 2 races, 2 winners in Pro-Am, but I'd say most of that is down to the reduced car count. For the entire Berlin section, only 3 cars competed in the Pro-Am class, which was definitely a disappointment, but with the state of the world at this time, there wasn't really much teams could do. As for the VIP drivers, well we saw a bit more from them this season than last. Expanding the entries to 2 cars helped a bit, and the best finish all year was Mario Dominguez's P3 in Mexico, but elsewhere we saw plenty of other drivers make names for themselves even if they didn't win races. Takuma Aoki of course, what he was able to do while paralyzed with hand controls was incredible. Nick Foster, who was brought in with no previous E-Trophy experience, went out and scored a P2 in his maiden race and almost scored a win in the third Berlin race. Even Paul Spooner did a decent enough job considering he had been a last, last minute replacement. It's a shame there wasn't a season 3, as by now the driver lineups were absolutely heating up, and I think next season would have been the most competitive one yet. Now that I've finished covering the history of the E-Trophy, we can talk about the series in a more broad sense, and I can explain the positives and negatives I took away from it. 
Starting with the positives, one of the biggest positive aspects of the series was that it served as a testbed for Jaguar's road car program in a way that their Formula E team probably couldn't. By running what was essentially a modified road car, they could draw more conclusive parallels that could benefit them in developing technology for the road legal eye pace. According to Jaguar themselves, the program allowed them to test and learn more about battery management, regulation of thermal systems, torque delivery, and even helped increase the range of the eye pace. In this sense, the series was a huge success. Another positive aspect I'd say was that I liked the shorter form factor races. When I began my research on this series and saw that the races were only 25 minutes plus one lap, I thought that at that rate, they seemed a bit too short to be worth watching. I was definitely wrong about that. Less time means more action packed into a shorter form factor, generally leading to better overall racing. And on the flip side, if there was boring racing, as we had from time to time, we didn't have to suffer through much of it before the race ended. Another positive has to be the diversity of the series. For once, we had a good mix of male and female drivers from many different nationalities, and it didn't really seem forced. The female drivers weren't slouches either, we saw some real competition from them. Heck, Catherine Legg won the Season 1 e-trophy race after leading every lap from pole. Even Alice Powell and Celia Martin were fairly competitive in their classes. And in terms of overall diversity, we can't forget about Tsuhuma Aoki. The fact that a paralyzed driver was able to use hand controls and be competitive with the rest of the field was just incredible. From a diversification aspect, the series definitely succeeded. One final positive I'd like to add, the series just looked really cool. The modifications done to the I-Pace completely transformed it from a stylish grocery getter to an aggressive, sleek looking race car that just looked awesome. In addition, we saw some awesome liveries during this time, which were really elevated by the shape and era of the car. From an aesthetics point of view, the series definitely gets the thumbs up from me. And now we get on to the negatives of the series, and there are quite a few. First and foremost, who in their right mind thought it would be a good idea to race SUVs in the already overconstricted tight street circuits Formula E races on? Formula E cars are tiny by comparison, and even they have to work hard to make passes on those tracks. What did they think would happen if they threw full-on SUVs in there? To add on to this, because of the tight street circuits and limited opportunities to pass, we saw a lot of banging, scraping, and bent bodywork, especially in the first season. When you have over 10 full-size SUVs and all of them are trying to set it into a tight 90 degree corner, contact is bound to happen. In the end, all this did was hurt the competition for the series. As more cars were damaged, they drop out of contention for the win. Another huge negative I have is that energy was almost a non-factor in these races. In Formula E, energy management is almost as important a quality to have in a driver as racing talent. It's absolutely crucial to success in the series and plays a role in the outcome of almost every Formula E race. In the E-Trophy, despite being electric, there was no worry about running out of energy, no worry about overconsuming or needing to save. This eliminated a huge aspect of strategy. In fact, the first season had almost no strategy at all. It was just start the race, race each other, and finish the race, which I guess is good in a simplistic aspect, but it didn't aid the on-track product at all. Introducing attack mode was a huge help, but again, it didn't add any energy conservation, which I think is an important aspect to have when this is dubbed as a feeder series to Formula E. Another negative I have is with the VIP drivers. I get Jaguar was trying to find local drivers to race alongside the full-time drivers, but like I mentioned earlier in the video, some of the names they chose had no business being there. Very few VIP drivers were actually competitive. What I think was a huge missed opportunity was to throw some Formula E drivers in the VIP car and see how the series regulars would do against them. The closest we got was Salvador Duran in Season 1, who besides causing a pileup, didn't do much. But say they threw in a Nelson Piquet Jr., or an Alex Lynn, or a Mitch Evans, or even a James Collado. I doubt they were able to have drivers from other teams run the Jaguar due to manufacturer commitments, but they had a perfectly good roster of drivers who were racing in the same exact place the same exact weekend. Why couldn't they be invited for a one-off? We saw Adam Carroll, who raced for Jaguar in Formula E in Season 3, fill in the last few rounds of Season 1 of the E-Trophy, and he was pretty competitive. Bringing in Formula E drivers could bring some much needed attention to the series. Imagine a duel between Mitch and Simon Evans for the win of a race. That's marketing practically writing itself. Another more minor negative with the series I'd say was the way its points were tallied up. Both the Pro and Pro-M classes are given points separately, meaning A, every driver who finishes the race scores points, and B, if you for some reason retire or can't start the race, it's almost unrecoverable for you in the championship, as he scores zero points. Missing one race for Brian Sellers was enough to knock him from second in points, six back, to being out of contention completely, all due to a qualifying crash. All in all, I think the points could definitely be weighed more evenly. Another small gripe I had was with the graphics shown on screen during the races, particularly the scoring pylon. The leaderboard barely shows any information at all, just the driver, their number, and their class. Nothing about which team they race for, or even what color their car is, which can be confusing for new fans and was definitely confusing for me during research for a while. Here's a quick mock-up I made, which I think looks a lot better. And the final negative I have written here has to do with the two classes, Pro and Pro-Am. 
While a good idea on paper to divide the championship between the more and less experienced drivers, I still don't really see a point when all drivers are driving the same car in the same race. Yet somehow both classes were still pretty solidly separated, so either there was a clear divide in driver talent, or the Pro-Am cars were somehow slightly slower. Still, when there's a high car count in both classes, maybe there's a point in having them separated. But after the pandemic wiped out almost all of the Pro-Am grid, why have a Pro-Am class at all? If they were combined with the Pro class, we could see a closer comparison in terms of driver talent, and it would make the series a bit less confusing for newer viewers. Even though I'm not a huge fan of it, they could use something like Success Ballast to even the playing field a little bit. In addition, exactly zero drivers from the Season 1 Pro-Am class graduated to the Pro class. Like I said before, Bandar al Asai absolutely dominated the first season of Pro-Am, but was given almost nothing to reward his efforts, eventually leaving the series. Naki Zhang finished second in Season 1 after winning three races. You'd expect him to jump up to Pro, but no, he was still in Pro-Am for Season 2. Now before we get into how I'd fix the series, I'd like to share some of the views of the drivers. I reached out to a bunch of e-trophy drivers and received two responses back. One of them was Season 1 champion and overall probably the most successful driver in the e-trophy, Sergio Jimenez, who offered to do a quick interview over text. Here were some of his answers to my questions, and keep in mind, I don't think English is his first language, so I may have altered some of the sentences to make them a bit clearer. So the first question I asked is how did he and Jaguar Brazil Racing first get involved in the championship? According to Jimenez, he was looking for a new challenge. He and Caca Bueno began looking for a sponsorship, and they were able to put the sponsorship together and form the Brazilian team. I asked what he thought of the structure of the series, how the cars were supplied to the teams, the race formats, the point system, etc. He said that for the first two years, they were really working to improve every race. He thought it was a shame that the pandemic finished off the championship, because other factories, I'm assuming factory teams, were starting to show interest in the series as well. Next, I asked him about the divide between the Pro and Pro-Am classes. There seemed to be a clear divide between them. Was the reason for this just inexperience, or were there actually differences between the two classes of cars? According to Jimenez, the difference was only inexperience. I then asked him what his thoughts would be on potentially introducing energy conservation to the series. And Jimenez said that while it wasn't a factor, he really thinks they should have saved energy. He thought it would make the races a lot more interesting. I then asked him, after he competed in the series, was he contacted about any further deals because of his performance in the series? And in addition, was he offered any kind of opportunity in Formula E because of his success? He thinks that if the series had continued, he definitely would have found some for sure. What seems interesting is that he seemed to be in talks with Saudi Racing, about being a potential driver or driver coach, which I think probably would have happened in Season 3. And while it's a little difficult to interpret what he's trying to say here about Formula E, I do think he was actually close to a deal. Again, sponsorship is a big part of drivers getting opportunities, so it might not be egregious to say, if Jimenez had been able to secure a sponsor, he might have been able to sign a deal with a team, maybe even a development deal which definitely puts a little bit more credibility back into the series. And finally, I asked him what his favorite memory racing of the series was, and he finished off saying it was the overall atmosphere of the series, and that racing in the middle of the streets of Rome, Paris, and New York was really nice. Now, Jimenez wasn't the only driver who responded to me. The second driver who followed up was Season 1 TWR to Cheetah driver Stefan Radzinski, who was actually able to do a verbal interview. Here is a recording of that interview. Hello, here just to answer a couple quick questions regarding the Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy that I raced in in 2018-2019. So first one was, how did I get involved in the championship? Uh, first, was interested in the electric cars and what was happening. It was a new developing uh, racing market, so I was very curious about it. I went to Formula E race in Hong Kong in 2017 after I was testing uh, for a race team in Korea. Um, I met with some high-level Formula E uh, team executives and, and basically was told there's going to be opportunities in this sport, in this space, um, if you look to go down these roads. So I always kind of kept in touch with people that I knew from the sport when the series was announced and I saw it was a support series for Formula E. That was obviously a nice target for me. I just tried to get in touch with the series and people and basically through those relationships I went to the testing, I had a chance to see what everything was about, I didn't drive but had a good idea of what was happening and uh, the series ended up connecting me with the team um, that I ended up running with for the majority of the season. I think the championship was a great championship, I think it was very interesting. Uh, the biggest challenge or gripe I think all the drivers had was that the cars were quite big, the tracks were quite narrow. To differentiate between the drivers and the cars was very tough, so racing became quite difficult. Um, from my experience, the contact with the cars, any contact was very, uh, there was a very good chance it ended your race. 
So I had a few unfortunate incidents. Um, it was kind of some in my control, some out of my control that basically put my race to an end quite early. So um, that was the toughest part was just um, you get to race a very specific way. Obviously, same for everybody. So, you know, it's not uh, it's not one thing or another. Um, it's just the way it was. I think I would have loved the cars to be maybe perhaps a little bit quicker or maybe have the brakes a little less efficient so that the braking zones were a bit longer to in induce a bit better passing zones. But I had no in issues with the championship format or anything like that. I think that was all fair and fine. Um, I think they did a really good job putting it on, if I'm honest. And uh, I was definitely interested in coming back there was no energy conservation in our races. They were short enough where we could go flat out. Uh, I would have been open to that. I think perhaps the series wasn't keen on having their products running out of energy, um, especially in the first year of a series where they were trying to get their feet under them. So I, I understood why that was the case, but I thought it was a, a great, had great potential. Um, and I was definitely interested in coming back and it looks like I was gonna come back for a second season with a different team. Um, but it just didn't work out. So it was a cool moment in time. We got to race at some amazing places. I'll always cherish that. Uh, got to race all around the world and um, yeah, it was awesome. So I very much enjoyed my experience and um, yeah, it's too bad that the series is no longer there, but um, good to see Formula E's um, continued on and, and um, you know, it seems to be kind of getting back going after kind of a bit of a lull probably during the COVID pandemic and uh, yeah. All the best. So first of all, huge thank you to both drivers for taking the time to answer my questions. There are quite a few things to digest here. I was pretty surprised to hear that the gap between Pro and Pro-Am was down to driver talent alone. Even though I knew the series was spec, I was sure that maybe there was something the Pro teams found, some tiny adjustment that gave them the edge, but no, it was all down to driver talent. And I think the series definitely gave more opportunities than I first gave it credit for. I feel like if Jimenez had gotten a deal together before the series collapsed, they might have been able to save it just because of it being a successful feeder series. So with my grievances out of the way, why don't I do something productive and try to fix the series? Of course right now, there is no series to fix, but if Formula E and their partners want to try doing a development series again using production cars, here's what I would recommend. First of all, just make the cars a little bit smaller. I know they have to fit in the battery technologies and stuff and kind of keep the integrity of the car shape or whatever, but I think maybe they could shrink it down a little bit. I know Jaguar is looking to introduce a lot more electric models as the time goes on, so maybe use a model that's a little smaller, just to aid the product on street races a little bit. Number 2. I would lower the amount of energy each car gets to start the race. Although cars running out of energy near the end of the race could potentially be bad PR, having cars finish would be a testament to the car's regenerative ability. At the beginning of end in each broadcast, the commentator should really drive home the fact that the car is using, say, only 50% of the energy to run the full race, a bit like how they do in regular Formula E. And even if the drivers do run out of usable energy, make sure there's a reserve to have the car finish the race instead of the bad luck that would be stopping on track or whatever Valencia 2021 was. Energy conservation would add a huge stroke of strategy to the series. You can't just go flat out, you have to be cautious and conservative with where you make your moves. And if this ultimately does become a feeder series for Formula E, it can be good conservation practice for drivers looking to move up. The next thing I would try to do is get rid of the classes. For the time being, I just don't think there's enough entries to warrant having two classes. Having one class with about 10 to 15 cars each would probably suffice just fine. It would allow the drivers in the back to really push themselves to get better and maybe take risks in the term of energy. We see in Formula E that some of the back marker teams can be quick on one lap pace but suffer in terms of energy efficiency. In this series though, that wouldn't be a problem as all cars are built to spec. It would really benefit the driver's skill and regen ability to have spec cars in one class. Speaking of drivers, the VIP system would get a bit of an overhaul. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't think many of the VIP drivers chosen were really impressive. And with two VIP cars in Season 2, there was really a chance to give some bigger names a ride. So what I would do is set one VIP car aside and use this as an opportunity to put active Formula E drivers in the car. Like I said before, I'm not really sure if other manufacturers would be okay with their drivers racing the series. But Jaguar has four drivers now, even if they don't feel up to it, I'd really incentivize them, maybe even make it part of their contract. Overall though, I think you need to make these VIP drivers real challenges for the regulars competing. If a series regular is able to beat a full-blown Formula E driver, one-to-one -one and equal equipment, think of how impressive that would be to the driver's career and their future prospects in Formula E. They can even play it up as a competition, offering a reward of money or bonus points if they're able to beat one. Of course, as a support series to Formula E, I'd keep most of the races as support races on the Formula E weekend. So looking at this past season's calendar, here's what I would look at keeping. I would axe races at Hyderabad, Sao Paulo, and Monaco as those tracks are either a bit tight or to give the drivers a bit of a break. Another thing I'd look at is potentially venturing to some tracks outside of the Formula E bubble as test races in case Formula E ever wanted to go there. 
Of course, it would be a bit of a logistical nightmare, as I don't think the series has the popularity to sustain a single weekend all to itself, which is why I don't have these races listed, but I'd say it's something worth looking into if another major series is racing there already. Legacy. Of course, the likelihood of a series like the E-Trophy returning is very slim, and even slimmer now based on the direction Formula E looks to be heading in terms of support series with the ACE or Formula G championship. Still though, I think the Jaguar IPs E-Trophy should definitely be remembered for its ambition. Formula E had been going strong for four seasons, and had just made a radical change to their car style to start season 5, but they still thought that they could implement a support series with one of the world's leading car manufacturers in Jaguar, and they did it. Though the execution of course was a bit disappointing, I think if the COVID pandemic hadn't hit, we still would have seen a very entertaining second season with a points battle in both classes. And not to mention the technological developments Jaguar were able to introduce into their road cars because of their program in the series. As of 2023, Jaguar is looking to commit to exclusively producing electric vehicles, hopefully by 2025. I can't help but think that part of their confidence has to do with the rapid development of their EV program within the E-Trophy. That's an aspect I don't think can be overlooked. And so with that, that was the complete history of the Jaguar I-Pace E-Trophy. This was a massive project, and I thank you all for making it this far. I started this project way back in April of this year, and I'm just now getting around to finish it, so I really appreciate the support as I put a lot of effort into this and spent hours of research, writing, and editing to hopefully do the series enough justice. I sincerely hope that if you began the video believing the series was just a complete and utter failure, you've at least slightly changed your mind. And one last thing before we end it off here, if you would like to watch any of the races in the Jaguar I-Pace E Trophy like any of the full races, shoot me a message over on Discord. Just shoot me a friend request and I'll be able to send you the links to the races that you need. I don't want to risk putting them here in case someone from Formula E ends up seeing this and like, takes it down for whatever reason, so just to be safe, let me know if you want to watch it. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.